In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So Rabbi Harold Kushner writes in his book, Who Needs God? That religion is not primarily a set of beliefs, a collection of prayers, or a series of rituals. Religion is first and foremost a way of seeing. It can't change the facts about the world we live in, but it can change the way we see those facts, and that in and of itself can often make a difference. Read that second part one more time. Religion is first and foremost a way of seeing. It can't change the facts about the world we live in, but it can change the way we see those facts, and that in itself can often make a difference. And Jesus says to the Samaritan, your faith has made you well. The Greek root for that word sozo can also be translated healed or saved, or my favorite, made whole. Your faith has made you whole. However we translate it, one thing is clear. There's more at stake than just being cured of leprosy. To be made whole, that is giant. I think so much of what poisons us is the part that we see in ourselves that we don't think is whole. That little piece that's missing, even if everything in life is falling into place beautifully, that one little piece that's missing or that shines brighter in someone else will consume us. To be made whole is maybe the most important piece of being healed, of being full of really being able to celebrate and live a grateful life. Curing and healing and being made whole are not the same. They may be pieces of the same, but they're not the same. To be made whole is to stop spending so much of our physical, our mental, and our spiritual energy fixated on what we see as missing or on greater display in someone else. To be made whole changes the lens in which we see ourselves our lives, and how we look at other people. Health, material wealth, or at least security, family, friends, they're important, they're critically important, and they certainly contribute to wholeness, but wholeness requires us to change the way we see everything else. And today we have two curing stories, or healing stories, but we also have two wholeness stories of people coming to wholeness. Worth noting that there's no greater leveler in this world probably than disease. I have heard several cancer patients say that the experience of going to an infusion center is one of the most stark realizations that we're equal. It's absent the usual distinctions that, uh, that stratify life People don't care when you're hooked up at a cancer center to your level of education, your class, your wealth, your religion, ethnicity. All of that is almost invisible. Sickness is the common and sadly leading characteristic. Leprosy is very much the same. Naaman depends on his wife's servant for healing. His wife's servant, who was essentially plunder from a military victory. And what is it that struck her? I think that's one of the incredible, the small characters in the story. She is plunder from her master's military victory. And yet when he is struck with leprosy, instead of saying, just deserts, good for him. Teach him to come and wipe out my village, probably kill a brother or two of mine ruin my way of life, she says, I know someone who could make you well. Wow. And then in the gospel, a Samaritan, the sworn enemy of the Jews, is living together in exile with the Israelites. Illness, leprosy is their common bond. Naaman also depends on an enemy prophet and even goes to an enemy king. So back to Naaman's story. 
So he's a great military leader. He's had several victories. He's in really well with the king. He is someone who is elevated in status. He has security. He has a beautiful wife. Things are going well for him until he's struck with leprosy. And you can only imagine how those two conflict with one another. Mighty, proud, military hero, and quickly disfiguring facial features, infirmity, isolation. Imagine, elevated war hero with this beautiful wife and ample security, realizing a very narrow future of increased disfigurement and isolation. And fear, something that maybe didn't consume him on the battlefield, but is consuming him now. So he goes to the king of Israel, bearing considerable gifts, which you ought to bring if you've defeated them, and now we're going to go ask for a favor. And the king, who's unable to help, now feels doubly impotent, tears his clothes, but fortunately, Elisha gets word of this and offers aid. However, that's not how the story ends. So Naaman shows up at Elisha's house and inches from his deepest desire being realized or the deepest desire of anybody suffering from leprosy, healing. It's within his grasp. It's right there. And yet when he's not met by Elisha and he's met by a messenger who says, just go dip in the Jordan River, he is irate. He almost jeopardizes that healing that's right there uh, because he's confronted with something else that plagues him. And I love how God does this. The person who needs not only to be healed but to feel touched and not untouchable, God touches. To the one who needs to realize they are no better or worse than the untouchable, God sends a messenger of a messenger and says, go wash in the Jordan. And I've seen the Jordan. It's a pretty paltry river. And I can see why he assumed uh, with all of his accolades, all of those victories, all of his might, that he should get one of the mighty rivers and that the, um, the, the chief prophet should come out and do some 30-minute ritual over him that would make him clean. But it was so simple. And until his servant, again, another small character, says, listen, if he'd asked you to do something complicated, wouldn't you have done it? But Naaman needs wholeness as well as healing, and that has to come through the humility of realizing that his core identity is not uh, a conqueror, but is a beloved child of God. And wholeness can only come through that and the healing of the leprosy. And then today's gospel. So take what I said about the fear surrounding leprosy, uh, about leprosy being uh, an incredibly feared and... Uh, um, an anxiety-riddled disease, and magnify it infinitely uh, within the people of Israel. Uh, one of the things that the Israelites were phenomenally good at is keeping people safe from disease. Other uh, folks from around the globe looked at the Israelites and said, how did they do this? And part of it was that the law, uh, the law had a lot of wisdom about uh, keeping uh, people who were contagious away. The purity laws, uh, the, the cleanliness uh, standard uh, helped uh, avoid the spread of disease. There are two chapters dedicated just to leprosy. Uh, the 13th chapter of Leviticus reads like a medical journal with descriptions, uh, very vivid descriptions of what is leprosy and what kind of leprosy uh, makes you unclean enough to not be able to be uh, uh, within uh, the confines of, uh, of the city. Uh, what levels of uh, leprosy are more just uh, ones we'll just observe and keep an eye on? It's very explicit. And then the 14th uh, chapter is all about when you have been deemed unclean, how you can be restored to your community. You have to go and see a priest, and the priest uh, has you shave every uh, bit of body hair, uh, bathe and clean your, your stuff. You sleep outside the tent for seven days, and then you go back to the priest. And if you're still clean, uh, then you can begin the process of re-entry into your family and your religious community. Uh, but it, it was incredibly isolating. Uh, and because leprosy was so isolating, uh, a theology developed around it. Uh, that we're not just isolating you um, because you were unfortunate recipient of, a, 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 of, um, of whatever causes leprosy, uh, 
but it was because you were bad, because you did something unsavory or your parents did something unsavory and God is punishing you. And that's how we can avoid you uh, and wash ourselves uh, of your predicament. Uh, and not only were they isolated outside the town walls, but they had to wear uh, certain identifying garments, sometimes bells attached to them. Uh, they had to scream out in advance of anybody coming near them uh, so that people would know uh, that a leper was nearby and avoid them. Uh, and you can only imagine the level of isolation. So that's the context for the gospel story. And so you have these 10 folks whose only community um, is based on the fact that they are all isolated from any other community, religious or otherwise, that they know. And it just happens one is a Samaritan. And so they're there, and a group of people uh, are walking by, and they make themselves known. They're loud. Uh, but instead of just saying, lepers, avoid us, they say, please have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. And Jesus does. And he does tell them, go. He says, go and you'll be healed. Go to the priests. Uh, let them see that you're healed. And then you can be restored to your community. Uh, and they do what they're told. And because, the, uh, because society and the law has uh, put fear upon their shoulders, that's their first response. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to dilly-dally. I'm not going to have a conversation about uh, how great it is to be healed. I am going to run because I want to be restored to the community. And I am afraid except for one, one who isn't burdened by the religious institution of the time. And that's worth paying attention to, that the religious institution that is supposed to give you a lens of how to look at the world uh, with grace-filled eyes is the one that is putting the burden on the shoulders of those who are inflicted. And it's the Samaritan who can respond uh, with so uninhibited grace and appreciation and gratitude. It's interesting. Amidst the uh, Reformation and all of the, uh, the scrutiny over uh, the church and how we do worship, someone asked Martin Luther, uh, what is the nature of true worship? What is true worship? And his answer was it's the tenth leper looking back. That the nature of our worship, uh, the response of us as gathered people, is to be that tenth leper looking back. Our worship, our religious life, is about being filled with gratitude. Even when we don't feel it, about coming and committing to that gratitude. The very word that is used for the response that he was thankful, that he said thank you, is the word Eucharisto, which is the word for Eucharist, is which is what we do together when we come together. Our worship, our religious life is about Eucharist. It's about giving thanks. And sometimes as a response to life, but sometimes to shape our lives. We commit to gratitude because of all those things that we cannot change. Certainly not on our own. Our commitment to worship, our participation in this community, our care for one another, our commitment to giving, all bend the pieces of our lives, all the pieces of our lives, towards gratitude, towards thanksgiving, and yes, towards wholeness. Today we will approach the table, and as we do, we give thanks for the grace and love poured out for us in that bread and wine. We receive that grace we also commit ourselves to being shaped by gratitude, shaped by what we, in fact, receive. And then as we walk out of here, we'll be given a pledge packet and asked not only to make a commitment to support our parish and all the work of the parish, but also to make our commitment to our participation in the story, to our acknowledgement that the story of the 10th leper is our story. Amen.